Wonderful. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to this wonderful event. Are you not super interested? I am in how to have a sustainable career. I've had a few. I'm sure that a few people in the room have. And for those of you who haven't had one yet, this will be a good tip on how to keep one when you've got one. So I'm really looking forward to tonight in, in terms of our um, topic and our speakers. But before we get going, let me do a bit of homework for you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today and pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. And welcome you to the GBS Alumni Network for uh, tonight. So this is a really important event for us. We've had over 40 years in the business school of connecting alumni and we have over 40,000 alumni. Uh, around the world. So this network, uh, what you see tonight is just the tip of the iceberg and we can start to connect from here as we go on. And I'm sure you'll hear from our speakers tonight that networking is incredibly important. This network is all around about providing opportunities for alumni and how we can support uh, future opportunities for those. And we've had some really exciting innovations occur. This year we've again partnered with the Queensland Business Monthly to offer the QMB Griffith MBA Responsible Leadership Scholarship uh, and this competition offers a prize package of up to $95,000. So it's enormous. It includes a full MBA scholarship and a half Griffith MBA scholarship. So uh, a fantastic opportunity that links with our core values. That's the QBM uh, Griffith MBA Responsible Leadership Scholarship. So that's one you want to keep your eye on. The nominations close tomorrow, so if you think you might know someone who might like $95,000, um, or yourself, please see Natasha and she will be able to help you out uh, during the break. And we've got some other information out on the reception desk for you as well. In addition to that, we have awarded over $1.1 million in scholarships and prizes. So we are really pushing in this space and in fact our alumni advisory board have come together uh, this year themselves and pulled funds to help one student receive an equity scholarship. So that was a fantastic achievement on their behalf and it just shows what people can do when everybody comes together and pulls together. And if you'd like to become a part of that group, uh, you're also welcome to do so and we've got some information for you around joining that alumni advisory group as well. We've got our Outstanding Alumni Awards again. So some new developments there, so everyone's aware of what you can nominate for and you can enter. Entrepreneurial Alumnus of the Year is a new category. So we're moving into that entrepreneurship space. So helping to support our alumnus who are out there doing wonderful things, that's a new category. Along with our traditional Outstanding Alumnus, Young Alumnus and the International Alumnus of the Year category. So I encourage you to think about people that might be uh, great nominations for those and it may of course include yourself. The gala dinner is on the 3rd of November at the Sofitel and we'd encourage you of course to come along and join in and network with that and we've got some information on the desk for you there. So what's happening today and what's going to happen tonight? Well we've got two sessions. So first of all we're going to have some talks from each of our guest speakers and they are going to talk to you for a period of time and I'll take you and introduce each of them in a moment and then we're going to have a bit of a Q&A, so if you've got questions or you can think of questions as the speakers are talking, please make a note. You've got pens and paper there for you to do that. And I will facilitate the Q&A after each of our speakers have spoken. Then we'll have supper and then afterwards we're going to have a workshop uh, with Karen Schmidt, who's going to take us through um, five steps of how to keep a, su a sustainable career, which will be excellent. So let me introduce each of our speakers now. So first one, uh, Karen Schmidt is a frontline leadership expert with Let's Grow and has spent 14 years working in seven different industries before she discovered her strength, completed an adult education degree and started her own uh, speaking and coaching business. So Karen is here to talk to us tonight. We have Paul um, Simshauser, who is the Director General at the Department of Energy and Water Supply. And I won't make any jokes about water, I promised him. Um, and prior to his current role, Paul was the AGL Energy's Chief Economist. He's also held senior executive positions at Stanwell Corporation, New Gen Power and Babcock and & Brown. Paul was recognised with the Griffith Business School's Outstanding Alumnus Award in the year of 2016. So Paul joins us as well. And our last speaker is
is Rick, Rick Zanetti, who is here uh, from Zanetti Recruitment and Consulting, and he's got a career history spanning 32 years in financial services, and he has experience in recruiting, coaching staff, managing products, processes, and influencing change. And his corporate career includes roles with AMP, Suncorp, AXA, before establishing Zanetti Recruitment and Consulting. So please join me in welcoming our three speakers. <clears throat> So, the uh, synopsis for tonight is around the fact that statistics suggest that the average person is going to make a career change approximately five to seven times during their working life and even more for Gen Y. This combined with populations that are living longer and, and working longer, the predictions are that 40% of the current jobs won't exist uh, in 2050. So, it's clear that the ability to transform your career is no longer just about satisfying personal preferences and needs. So tonight we're going to look at tips and advice on how we can successfully make transitions into new careers and discover how to determine what career change might be right for us and how we can upskill and how best we can find a new industry. So I will be listening with great intent. All right, so that is the business of the welcome. I would like to now start to call upon each of our speakers who will present to you uh, their topic. So our first speaker will be Karen and her topic will be around how to determine what career change is right for you and when is the correct time or signals to start making that change. Please welcome Karen. I don't like standing behind lecterns. To start with, I'm too short. <laughs> career change. I uh, sat down thinking about how many times I have changed careers in the 36 years that I have been working. It's really interesting that I think about that today because this morning I actually had breakfast with a friend of mine that I haven't seen for 35 years. We went to, we were teenagers together. We used to, and this is gonna sound really daggy, we used to go roller skating together. And he is now a uh, consultant in the engineering field and he happens to be in, in Brisbane today. And it got me thinking, you know, having breakfast with him around all those career changes I've been through. And what were those signals? What were those things that told me it's time to move on for something else? Because here's the one thing I, have, I can say to you that I have learnt the hard way in those 36 years. Is you need to start changing before you need to. Because it sneaks up on you. You're going along, you're happily with your career, happy with everything in your life, and then all of a sudden, maybe something completely beyond your control. A change in an industry, government legislation, downturn in the economy, change in your personal circumstances, and you can find yourself needing to change careers. So it's really about changing before you need to. But what are those signals? What are the signs that, that you need to change? Now, I've been talking to some people around the room before we started to get an, a bit of an idea of, of who's who. Um, who here is yet to start their career? Who's still studying at uni? Okay, we've got quite a few of you here. It's great to see some of our leaders of the future out there. Um, who's already been through some career change? Yeah, and, and who's actually in the process of doing it right now? Yeah, or having it forced upon them, right? So we're in the right, in the right room. So when I started thinking about the signals, there's actually a, a, a great book that I, I wrote, uh, wrote, read, by a woman called Stephanie Dowick. And she actually uses a term called noticing. And I think this is a really important one. When you start to notice, it doesn't mean you have to take any action, but that idea of you start to notice things should be a signal to you to start reflecting on, is this a sign I should do something? So when I thought about what are some of the things I noticed when it came to career change, and, he, and here's a few key words that came to mind for me. Let's see if you can relate to any of them. Boredom. Disappointment, anger, frustration, <laughs> the just the desire for something new or, this is, this is a really interesting one, envy. You look at someone else and go, gee, I wish I had Chris's job. Gee, that looks interesting. And jobs look great from the outside, don't they? And then you start talking to Chris and I have no idea what he does. We haven't actually met before. And you start talking to him and then you go, oh, well, that's not what it sounded like. I spoke to a couple of people earlier and said that um, when I was 16, I wanted to be an actor or a flight attendant. You know what? I didn't really want to be an actor or a flight attendant. Do you know what I figured out? It took me a while to figure out, do you know what I wanted to do? Travel and perform. 
So it's really interesting that when you look back on what those childhood dreams of yours might have been, they actually can be the essence of what your real career should be. What we've got to do is look past what are those instructions people give us. Who, who's got a parent, a teacher, some other adult in their life who, when they were younger, or those of you who are young now, is saying, oh, you really should do X because that's a good, and I, the, I hate this word, safe career. Yeah? Who's had this instruction? Yeah? It's like a girl I went to high school with, I saw her at my high school union, reunion a few years back, and she said, yeah, I remember the careers guidance counsellor at school telling me I should be a hairdresser because I have nice hair. It's like, who's giving this career advice? So it's, it's noticing, you know, when you're experiencing some of those emotions and then what it is about is once you've noticed is figuring out, well, what do I really want to change? And when I look back at the career changes I've had, because I, I've started out, I left, my goal when I was at school, apart from the actor and flight attendant thing, my goal when I was at school was really, really clear. Hmm? My goal was to not be at school. So I left in year 11. Got a job in a bank because that was where my father worked, so they'd let me do that. So I did sort of general admin work, fell into secretarial work because I apparently like to boss people around and that's what my manager wanted. And then someone said to me, Karen, you're really good at talking. <laughs> you should go into HR. Like, that's a reason to be in HR. But as it turned out, it was the right one. But when I look at all these things along the way of, of how I then went from HR to getting a degree in adult education, starting my own business, what I figured out is that, did I want to change things like the role that I was in, the industry that I was in? Did I want to change the kind of lifestyle that I had? And I'm very much, this business that I'm in now is about lifestyle. Yes, it's obviously it's about earning money, it's about helping people, but I'm realistic that I like the lifestyle that I have. So when you come to saying, I want to change careers, I want you to really think about why do you want to change? What is actually uh, feeding that? Do you want a different lifestyle? Is it that you, you want a different role? Do you want a different industry? Or the other one that I tried, of course, because I'm from Sydney. I lived in Darwin for three years. Ladies, I had bad hair every day for three years. Not good. And then I, and now here in Brisbane, location is another factor. So you need to put all those things in the mix when you start to say, well, what type of career change do you want? Because if you don't do it for the right reasons, you are going to find yourself in that next role. You'll enjoy it for a while. It'll go okay for a while. And then you'll find yourself wandering again. Anyone know someone who's done this where they've, they just keep changing careers and changing careers? You know why? They haven't really figured out their why. You know, I have a, a model that I use with people. I talk about having purpose, having focus and having the right locus of control. What's your purpose? What's your why? And I figured mine out a while ago. Curiosity. I'm a curious person. Who, who was I talking to before that I said I'm a, I'm a professional sticky beak? You know, I love asking questions. I mean, I'm curious about people. Curious to know where they've come from, why they make decisions that they do. But there are other purposes you could have. I've actually got a, a list of a few I've come up with and, um, and they all start with the letter C because that's just easier for me to remember. It could be about collaboration. It could be about community. It could be about connection. You notice none of these things are about making money or being famous or, you know, I know there's a few people, I, someone I've met today who the performing arts areas. You know, people who love, I think we've got a couple of musicians down the front here, just introduce themselves. People who love their music become famous as a byproduct of that, not that being their first goal. Has anyone know, met anybody who says, oh, my goal is I want to be famous? Like Kardashian famous? You know, it, it, no, it's not about being famous, it's about doing something you love, in your case the pursuit of, of music, and, and a byproduct is you become famous, and yes, you can then use that fame for good or evil, um, but people who set out to be famous have the wrong idea. Right? If you want to connect with an audience, that's a reason to do music. If you're curious about what that instrument can do, that's a reason to do music. So I want you to delve a little deeper than I want to earn more money, I want to, you know, I... I I just want to get up in my career, what I've learned is that if you understand why you do things, the why behind it, you're going to make much better choices about changing your career. And if you can, for those of you, the younger ones in the room, the quicker you can figure out, what is that core thing that you're about? Mine is curiosity. It explains why when I was a child, you know, I was always told I asked too many questions. 
I've now used that to my advantage in helping my clients by asking the questions nobody else will ask. I'm the outsider. I can come in and go, why do you do that, Wendy? Because <laughs> it looks dumb to me. <laughs> and if you can't explain it, then I'll go, well, why are we doing it? In the context of helping them to develop better team leaders. So I want you to think about that as you hear from our other speakers today. And at this point, I have no idea if I've used up my 10 minutes. Have I? I've got one and a half minutes to go. I love it. I love it. Um, so what I, here's what I've learned about career change. One final thing, and this is my other passion in life, is ballroom dancing. Anybody here like dancing? Any type of dancing, right? If you want to learn ballroom dancing, I do it in the valley. A couple of nights a week, come and see me in the break. But my point is that one of the things I love about dancing, and I use it a metaphor in one of my presentations, is this. When it comes to, to, to learning how to dance, sometimes you've got to step forward, sometimes you've got to step sideways, and sometimes you actually have to step backwards to make it work. The same is true in your career. So consider in your career change those sideways moves as well as those backwards moves it is not all going forward because if you just dance going forward, you look like a, a bad scene in a tango, you know, when they, they all go in the one direction. It's about moving in different directions and seeing what you learn. So I hope I've given you some things to think about. I'm going to be coming back later and doing a workshop with you where we're going to get a whole lot more practical around how do you then take some of those ideas and, and say, well, what do you do with it? How do I actually make a career change? Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, our next speaker will be Paul. Uh, Paul's going to talk to us now about his personal career and journey. Uh, as I said, Paul's Director General of Energy and Water Supply. Thanks, Ruth. Good evening, everybody. Um, hands up those of you who really like talking about your career. <laughs> that was what I said when they asked me to come. To <laughs> really? You really want me to do this? But I was thinking about it and because you're here, you better get used to it because you're talking about changing careers. I mean, that's what you're here for tonight. So I guess we better learn to get comfortable talking about changing careers. Does that make sense? Me too, including. Let me give you a bit of... I'm, I'm going to sort of talk just about... So my, my task tonight is just to talk about my career uh, for a whole range of reasons. Um, our musicians down the front here are going to be yawning. It sounds terribly boring and quite honestly, by comparison to what they do, it is boring. <clears throat> um, uh, but I'll, I'll just walk you through, I guess, uh, an applied perspective. Um, what I'm going to say is actually very consistent with what Karen has said. Um, uh, and, and in fact, as I was sitting there running through my notes that I wrote down, I thought I'd better put some structure around what I'm going to say tonight. Um, I couldn't help, help drawing, out those, um, drawing out those parallels. So I've, over the last... Um, so I'm a, I'm a Griffith graduate. Um, I, uh, I graduated a little while ago, um, and uh, and my basic. So I've got a, a, a few degrees. I've got a, a bachelor of economics from UQ, a bachelor of commerce and accounting and finance from Griffith, a, uh, a master's degree uh, in accounting and finance from Griffith, a PhD in economics from the University of Queensland, a CPA um, out of Deakin, and I'm actually on staff at Griffith University as a professor of economics. Um, but my substantive role is Director General of the Department of Energy and Water Supply, so I've been in that role for about two and a half years. Um, I have no experience as a public servant when I turned up to this role. Um, I'm not sure that I'm a very good one now either, quite honestly, but I've got very good people around me and that's all that really matters. Um, uh, I've actually worked in uh, a statutory authority. I started out life in the old Queensland Electricity Commission. Um, I've worked for two government-owned corporations, so two government businesses. Um, I worked for, in a firm that was you know, private equity. Uh, I've worked in three ASX listed companies, uh, including AGL, uh, Australia's second oldest company, where I was one of the uh, seven executives running that place. Uh, and now I'm in the public service, and of course I'm in the university sector. The only thing I haven't done is work in the third sector, you know, the not-for-profit, but there's still time. I, I haven't, so I'm planning to do that before I give, give, up, uh, give everything up, so I can say I've done all the institutional forms of employment. Um, you'll gather from those university quals, um, so I'm, I'm a qualified as an accountant. I don't admit that anywhere <laughs> except in rooms like this <coughs> because I was so bad at it. Um, I wasn't a very good accountant. Um, I, I did the accounting qualifications for the right reasons, of course. 
Um, but my sort of passion was really economic. So, so when people ask me what I am, I don't say I'm the Director General. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, in former lives, so I was, you know, I've been a CEO of a listed car. I didn't say I was the Chief Executive. When people ask me what I am, I say I'm an economist. I'm an energy economist, actually. That's, that's kind of my, my great passion in life. I was an energy trader for, you know, sort of the better part of eight or ten years. In fact, I set up a couple of trading floors in here, in, in Queensland, for some of the biggest utility companies in town. Made lots of money, um, had a few days where I lost lots of money, threw up in toilets, all that sort of good stuff, you know, from the amount of money I lost and survived it all. Uh, you know, retired gracefully. He was chief executive of a couple of different organisations, uh, chief economist of, uh, of Australia's biggest utility and, and one of our biggest um, listed companies. And, uh, and of course now director general in, in public administration. There was no master plan. I'm really sorry to say it was, uh, most of this has sort of been a bit of an accident, but it has been linear. That's the one thing I can say about my career. It's been a very linear career. Um, every next step felt quite logical compared to where I'd come from. And it's been a snowball of, of knowledge, of, of experience um, and, uh, and its application. Um, and what I can, I suppose, so let me just sort of abstract um, all of that um, sort of, you know, Cook's tour of, of a strange and, and weird set of academic and and, uh, and work-related experiences and just abstract it back to a couple of principles that I think have helped um, over the last couple of decades. The first thing I can tell you is you've got to be passionate about what you're doing. If you're not passionate about it, get out of Dodge. If you're in a job, don't like it, get out. Um, I'll tell you what happens when you're passionate about your job. When you're passionate about your job, you work harder. When you work hard, it's amazing how lucky you become. The harder you work, the luckier you become. There is absolutely luck in every successful career. Have no illusions. You know, it's not all hard work. There is luck. There's time. There's place. It's knowing the right people. There's, you know, being, you know, I mean, I've done a Sean Bradbury before. You remember? It was, no, sorry, Stephen Bradbury. Stephen Bradbury. I've done a Stephen Bradbury. I was the last one standing. It was kind of worked for me. I got a, got a pretty big promotion to my first executive role. I was 28 um, years old, put on, an, on the, in the executive ranks. That's, that's young. That's too young, by the way. Um, so I... I I, I paid for that um, uh, through that inexperience, um, but that was luck as well. Um, just right place, right time. Another thing I can tell you is that if you want to go to a better place, then you've got to be really good at what you're doing. You've got to be really good at your current role. I mean, you know, no one really gets excited about, I'd be really good at that role when you're crap in the role you're in. Does that make sense? It, it, it just doesn't work. You get tapped to go to different roles because you're really good at what you are doing. Hence, going back to, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, get out of Dodge. Go and find something that you are passionate about. Um, I've been through, you just heard that, that list of roles I've had. Um, this Director General role was the second role I applied for. So I'm 48 years old. I was, I was 46 at the time when I got the job. It was, the, it was only the second role I'd ever applied for. The first role I applied for was a cadet in the Queensland Electricity Commission back in 1991. Every other role from that point was a tap on the shoulder. And it was because I focused on doing my job really, really well. That's all I cared about. Um, and then each role that came from thereafter was someone tapping, saying, we've got your next job for you. This is what we want you to do. We've got this offer for you. You've got... So that was it. The two applications I've made, actually it was really interesting when I went for the DG role, I had no idea what I was doing. Terrible. Way out of practice. Um, <clears throat> Don't be, you know, in business, there's something I always used to sort of live and die by when, you know, we're sort of charting the strategy for an organisation, was don't be seduced by profitable distractions. So you need to think about that in a career sense. Don't be seduced by apparently profitable distractions. Um, just because someone offers you a big salary doesn't mean it's going to make you happy. You really need to find stuff you're passionate about. Not, not, not the dollars. The dollars, if you're after dollars, the dollars will come if you're passionate about what you're doing. And you know, my income scales over the years, I've gone all the way up to the sort of the seven digit stuff and back down again over the years. And I can mark my words, you know, no matter how much you're getting paid on, you know, whether, you know, through the, um, through your working career, if you, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, the money won't take the pain away. I can, I can guarantee you that. I guess, you know, in those profitable distractions, you also need to, need to think about your CV as sort of like accumulating a bunch of pretty neat logos. So you need to think about every step that you take. Um, uh, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Um, as you sort of move into different roles, you also need to sort of, you know, have, a, have an acute appreciation of your limitations. 
Um, there's lots of things that I'm not very good at. Um, for example, I'm not very good at the detail. Um, I was never going to make a good accountant, was I? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, and, you know, so I got that awareness that actually I'm a, bit, I'm a bit impatient with the detail. So I kind of ended up thinking, well, learning the accounting trade was a really good thing to do. You know, you hand me a P&L balance sheet and cash flow statement of any organisation, I can tear it to pieces. I'll tell you exactly the pulse of that organisation. That's as much of the accounting as I need to know from here on in. It's a really good skill to have. But I don't need to be an accountant because I was shit at it. <coughs> um, you need to have a plan of where you're going. I sort of said, you know, there was no master plan with mine. I mean, there wasn't a master plan to do all of that. I can absolutely guarantee you. But there was always a plan of where I was going. But you need to be pretty flexible with the plan um, because stuff's going to come along. You need to sort of... And I think, you know, Karen kind of, you know, there was a, there's a, a lot in, in, in what Karen was saying to you. It's just so true. You'll be sitting there, all of a sudden something will drop in, in front of you and then, you, you know, you need to be inquisitive and work out whether that next step's right or not. Um, I think the other thing too that really helped me over the years was <clears throat> you all heard of, uh, of, of mentors, me having a mentor. So I, I, someone pointed out to me one day, Paul, you didn't have mentors, you had sponsors. You know there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. Mentor, you know, gives you a bit of good advice. Sponsor gives you really good advice, better than the mentor does. And they're actually actually out there trying to work your next moves. So I had, you know, I had a, you know, there was a, a very, very famous um, uh, company chairman um, who a lot of you would all know, Elizabeth Nosworthy. She was, in fact, in, in, in her day, she was voted by her peers as Australia's top director. Great for, for a Brisbane person to get that gong when it's really a, a Sydney and Melbourne club. And I was one of her little protégés and, gee, I benefited from, you know, Elizabeth was a tough master, one of the toughest people I've ever worked for, but um, she, was, she wasn't a mentor to me, she was a sponsor. I mean, she was actively managing my career and my next moves, you know, and I ended up in a couple of organisations working for her or related organisations. So it was kind of lucky, you know, it's kind of, and, and again, a bit of luck in that, but the luck came because I was really passionate about what I did and she, she sort of really got what I did, appreciated it and became interested uh, in, in that, and that's how she became a, a sponsor, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a handful of um, the the really neat thing about uh, about the mentors, nonetheless, whether it's a mentor or a sponsor, it is actually really good to have those people, those old wise heads, because you find yourself in all in you know in circumstances where, quite honestly, you're out of your depth and you don't know what to do. And I'll give you a really simple example. The first time when I was so I was. A, CEO, a very freshly minted one. I'm running a business that had a you know four billion dollar uh, business, 800 employees, you know sort of power stations all over the country. We were listed on the ASX, and an employee died at work. I thought, holy shit, what do I do now? So the first thing I did was pick up the phone to Elizabeth and say, Elizabeth, what do I do? Just like... And of course, she was able to walk me through exactly what I needed to do. Paul, get out, jump on a plane, fly down there, get out on site. Here's you know, and just having that sort of you know, they don't teach you that stuff in business school, do they? But you know what? When you're running a business, everyone's watching what you do. And when you're not a business, when you're a graduate and you first turn up, everyone's watching what you do. You know, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of things where it's just kind of neat to have, have people you can bounce ideas around from um, because we don't all have the answers. I mark my words of all my... Exp I mean, I still come across situations once a week where I sit there and think, God, I wonder what to do next. And that's okay. Don't sweat it. Um, my dad always used to say to me, and I, and I, I <clears throat> and I can just sort of implore you, if there's, 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 there's two lines I'm going to give you today, this is one, and I want you to all remember it. Be very careful how you treat people on the way up because you never know who you're going to meet on the way down. I'll say it again. You know, be very careful how you treat people on the way up because you, you never know how you're going to meet on the way down. And it happened to me. I had my downfall. No good career does this. There are ups and there are downs. Every great, you know, the, the, the best of my knowledge, the best of my, you know, the areas where I've got real skill and all that sort of stuff is because I had a massive failure in it first. I, I mean, I learnt lots of stuff out of, the, out of university in the textbooks and in classrooms and hanging out with clever people, you know, and... and sponsors and mentors and bosses and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, there's nothing better than experiential learning. You learn that, you, know, you put your hand on a hot plate roughly once in your life, don't you? 
It's a sort of a slightly interesting but mostly painful experience. And lots of things happen to you like that in the workforce. You know, I remember waking up one morning, my name's all over the business pages and I was being smashed, you know, because of things that went wrong on my watch. You, know, you learn out of that stuff. And uh, when you're on your way down, it's the people you've been good to on the way through that will help you get back up. I was in the gutter, I can absolutely tell you that. I was really worried about what was happening next. Um, but, you know, I'd always lived and died by that little philosophy that my dad had drilled into me over the years. Another one that I really love, uh, and this is the other line I want you guys to all try and remember tonight, for, especially in those, uh, those of you who are sort of in those ranks of getting to graduate, to double your income, triple your rate of learning. I'll say it again, to double your income, triple your rate of learning. So you all know I've got a PhD, right? You've heard that earlier before, and I don't you know, a string of degrees. I'm a professor out here at the university. I still publish, you know, sort of two or three academic, you know, articles a year in, in the international journals. I've just enrolled myself in another course at Griffith University studying under Ian Tiernan, uh, one of the political scientists here at, at the university. Um, you don't stop. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bit weird being a professor and enrolling in a course, granted, but, you know... In my case, um, I kind of realised I had this, I had this, this, this black spot, you know, and uh, so I remember sitting down with Anne and saying, "Let's kind of, how do I work this out?" Sort of thing. So, in fact, I'm about to start my next course with a, doing a, we're doing a, a kind of a graduate certificate, a whole bunch of us. Um, you know, W income, triple your rate of learning. It's a really simple philosophy. So there's a, there's a guy, I can't think of his name, Robin Sharma or something, dialed that line out, or he he penned it, but. God, it's a, an accurate little little quip. Um, I've burned up a fair bit of time. Um, uh, but look, maybe, and there was a few other things I was going to rattle off about, but maybe I'll save it for later. Um, but I think above all, you know, Karen spoke about the why. You've got to understand the why. Um, I'll give you a, an adjunct to that. I, I think that's right, by the way. You've got to understand the why. Um, in my case... The why um, was probably the, you know, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be this rock star energy economist. That's really interesting if you're a propeller head, by the way. Um, and for the, for the rest of society, it's not. But in my case, that was my why. I wanted to make a real difference to, to energy, energy policy, energy planning, you know. I mean, I've been out, I've gone and sort of, you know, raised money and, uh, against and built power stations, syndicated debt up in Asia to, 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 to finance them traded them, you, you name it. I've done, done almost every, every aspect of it. And it drives me. I'm, I, I love this stuff, you know. Um, but the other thing, though, the other thing that's really is important is <clears throat> it's not about the what, it's about the how. It's not, a, not the what, it's the how. The what I do is sort of like kind of interesting, but it's how you go about it. You know, throughout the workplace, I guess, you know, you don't need to look smart, you just need to make sure that the job gets done, that you surround yourself with really smart people, uh, and then, you know, above all, you're a human in the workplace, that you look after people you, 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 and, and, you know, as you get into more senior roles, that you lead them well uh, and do so with humility. You know, you've got, to, you've got to do all the usual things in Leadership 101. You've got to inspire people, you've got to influence, you've got to, you know, drive change and all that sort of good stuff. But above all, you've, uh, you've got to look after the people that are working for you and if you can get that piece right, kind of, you know, people will work it out and, you know, if you want to make a career change, people will come to you. Thanks, everyone. Now I'd like to welcome our uh, last speaker. Rick is going to talk to us about how we can position ourselves to sell ourselves to our potentially new employer. Please welcome Rick. Thank you. Okay. Let's see how we go. I am going to use the lectern uh, to each their own. It's my prop. Um, and I will use some slides as well. Um, so much to share and so little time in 10 minutes and I think um, what, what I'll be discussing tonight and what I'll be sharing, I think we'll see again some very common themes in, um, in regards to uh, what Paul and Karen have said. Um, one of those common themes is the why and um, but I think the topic tonight was about selling yourself and to a potential employer. And I know we've got people in the room who are students, graduates, alumni,
considering career transition, mid-career. Uh, it may not be linear like Paul, it might be heading in a completely different direction. Um, and so you may have a perception about what I was going to talk about, but I th actually think it's going to be very different. Because um, the first thing that needs to be achieved, in my view, before wherever you are in your career, is selling yourself to an employer is not a task at a point in time. It's not, I'm not going to talk to you about what you need to say when you're sitting in an interview, how you need to present. Um, it is a series of deliberate activities. Um, and I can't say that personally I've done this through my life, um, but I've learnt along the way. And um, the, the why question is an incredibly powerful question. The greatest challenge for me personally has been reflection. You can ask yourself that question, but you need to spend a lot of time uh, on the reflection and understanding why you want to make a decision to change. And I agree, again, with Karen, a lot of the reasons why and a lot of the indicators for yourself as to why a change may happen. So I suppose what I'm saying is there's no quick fixes. And it's the planning and subsequent action that you take that are extremely important. And the research that you do, the understanding, the consequences and the validation of that are all important before you make a decision to act, whatever that decision is. And um, so if I think about my own career, I've not reinvented myself, but I've had probably about five significant changes in my career. Three of those are within the industry, the financial services industry that I worked for 22 years. Um, one of those was utilising the skills to create the business that I have today for the last 10 years. And to be honest to myself and to you, one of those I fell into. And sometimes that happens. Was it the right decision? For me it was, maybe it's not for others. So for me at the age of 53, and I acknowledge, and this is a learning for me, I acknowledge I've learned a lot in 32 years. But what I've also learned is I know very little. There is so much more to learn. And I think that's really important to understand and leveraging from what Paul said, it is about continuous learning. So the planning here needs to be done. Not if you're a graduate now and then that's it, or even in your career as you progress. It is an iterative process, an iterative review process that you should do throughout your whole career. And that's what I've found. Um, so um, if you do this, if you set those goals, what I've found for myself is that you gain confidence in yourself. So if you've got clarity of goals, what you'll find is um, you'll have more confidence in yourself and how you communicate with potential employers will also change. So um, there's a large number of graduate uh, students or graduates in the room and um, it's important to understand who employers are, and they don't all think the same way. But uh, a body of research that I did in collaboration with Professor Mark Brimble at Griffith um, around the financial planning industry in a certain sector, we, we talked to a lot of employers, especially in the SME marketplace, and many of those are baby boomers. Now, I'm on the cusp. I sit on the cusp of Gen X and Gen uh, and, and Boomer. And... Uh, for many of them, and I'll read some of the comments, because there's this perception that millennials, okay, so those of you in the room who were born between 1980 and 2000, around that sort of period, there's a perception that you're fickle and you're disloyal, and, and it's not all employers, by the way, but it does exist out there. And I'll just read to you some of the comments that were made. Um, it's extremely difficult to manage expectations of Gen Y entrants. They generally want to uh, achieve so much in very little time, so staff retention becomes very challenging. Um, another one says it, it is risky as they historically have no knowledge of the industry and Gen Y folk think they should progress from CSO to CEO in two years. Now, you and I know this isn't the truth for everyone and I think 
having done some further research, and, and we did a body of research around millennials, um, the pre-war generation was saying exactly the same thing about the boomers when they were young. This is an issue that um, is a perception by those who are ageing. And, and those who think this way are wrong because um, as, as a millennial, as someone in that age group, the reality is there's going to be a variety of different people. And whether it was 30 years ago or whether it's today, the only difference is that you're living in a very different environment to the environment I grew up in. So um, I think the learning for me in this is that not all employers think this way. Some employers perceive it, but it's not the reality. Um, people are not the same and it's wrong to group by age or other certain categories. And you need to understand that a potential employer may think this way. Um, it's also your responsibility to prove them wrong. I was asked to talk about different industries and, and industries on the rise. We're very specific um, in financial services in a very much a niche around funds management, super insurance and financial planning. Um, I, I probably in the 10 minutes don't have the time, but I think it's more about understanding um, the broader factors in the marketplace that are impacting on potential industries rather than just talking about what industries are on the rise because um, there's a lot of data out there and, and SEEK and the NAB economic team uh, do a lot of data about job advertisements and where we're seeing it on the rise and right now they're saying the, the largest rise is in, um, I think it was um, uh, uh, area of energy and, uh, and uh, mining as and go uh, gas and oil extraction the issue is it's coming off a very low base. So if you see this exceptional rise in jobs, that isn't necessarily the case. So I think diving deeper into the data, there's a number of factors. Um, financial services I've put up there, it's a very fickle industry. So right now it's, it's quite buoyant, but there are other factors and certainly economic factors that um, can have a significant impact and pull the brakes on the financial sector very quickly. Um, Political influence is significant in the industry and, and an example could be if it was a change of government and a Royal Commission of the Banks and the impact that that might have on the industry in, in Australia. So there's so many factors that, that may have an impact. There are sustainable industries and financial services will continue to be. Um, but again, there's probably not a lot of time to talk about it. So this slide is titled Summary, but I think um, it's probably more about learnings that I just want to share. And they're all linked. Every one of these are linked. Um, other than, obviously, not knowing how to spell yourself. <laughs> um, research and planning, we've all, we've all talked about. Um, I don't want to go there again, but I think the important point here is you don't rely on jobs to come to you. Now, what I've seen and the experiences I've had with candidates and something I learned is if you don't go and look for it, it isn't going to happen. So, I challenge you whether you're a graduate or mid-career transitioning. What you need to do, obviously you've done the planning process, you've got an understanding of the industry you want to pursue. The next thing you need to do is identify those people in that industry or people you know that can give you a referral, make a list and contact them. It's very important how you contact them. Because when you ring, you say, hi, it's Rick Zanetti. John suggested I give you a call. Can you help me, please? It's a very important question. Because if you ask that question, generally people don't say no. People will say yes. Can you help me, please? I'm not looking for a job, but I'm very interested in the industry. And I'd love to learn from someone like you who has that experience. Can I have 15 minutes of your time? So that starts the process of building a circle of influence, certainly if you're a graduate, but it's also about what you're demonstrating. It is about demonstration of initiative. So if I was to use an example, there's a gentleman I met about four years ago who was managing surf clubs. He was in his late 30s. Um, he was very good at what he did. He had great business acumen. And he, wanted, he had an interest in the financial planning industry. 
And so he decided to go meet people. He decided to get on the phone and go talk to people, and he did. And for about six months, he built his knowledge about the industry. And he decided to do a postgraduate uh, diploma in financial planning. And at that point, he contacted me. Now, we sat down, and a lot of people we engage with generally have existing experience in the industry. Um, and we sat down, and his journey and his story to me, what was incited me to introduce him to one of the big four. And four years later, he still has a successful career in that space. I suppose what I'm saying is he showed the initiative. He was passionate. You know, it was talked about by Paul, if you're not passionate, then you're clearly not in the right place. He gave me the insight into him and the passion to support him because I knew he was going to be successful. So, um, and it leads into one of the other points around treat everyone you speak with as a potential employer. Because I've had people turn up in my office in a polo shirt and I say, what are you doing in a polo shirt? Oh, well, I'm here for an interview, but you're a recruiter. Well, that to me says lack of respect and you reckon I'm going to present you to one of my clients if you can't show me the respect. So we have a mantra, everyone deserves the same amount of respect, just not the same amount of time. And so um, that particular person didn't get a lot of our time. Um, but. The, the point being here is everyone is a potential, treat everyone as a potential employer. So the person that I just spoke about, um, he treated me like a potential employer. I saw his passion. He demonstrated his initiative. I wanted to support him. I think about another young man who, uh, Michael, who finished his commerce degree, went into banking, two years down the track said, I'm not enjoying this. And he, um, he basically, I gave him an introduction. He said, look, I've got a real interest in the energy markets. Do you know anyone? And he was the son of a, of a friend of mine. And I introduced him to a few people and he ran with it. He ran with it, he maintained contact and it's not written up there, but front of mind awareness is another factor that you need to consider. Because an employer who meets you, if there's not an immediate need today, but thinks you're a credible, competent individual that they like, in three months' time, generally, from my experience, can't remember your name. It is up to you to maintain front of mind awareness, maintain contact, I'm not talking about badgering them, but respectful contact. So Michael did that and he ended up in the industry and he's doing really well. So again, I think front of mind awareness, treat everyone as if they're a potential employer, whether they're a referrer, whether they're a recruitment consultant, whoever they are. Um, the passion, that passion piece. Um, I was at a, wrap it up. I was at a uh, uh, completely unrelated at the uh, State Library last night. There was a movie called, um, Neon, and it was about the history of neon signs. I was there because a friend who makes neon signs was on a panel afterwards, and the writer, of the director, and Michael were on the platform. And you could see the people in the room who had that passion. I've walked out of there thinking, I'd like to know more about neon signs. It's the same issue for you. How you engage, how you present, if you're passionate, people will see that. Um, so I'm going to be very quick in saying, um, I'll finish with a quick story. You can read the rest there. Has anyone heard of Tom O'Toole, the baker from Beechworth? Okay, a very unique character, very unique character. This is a guy who um, bought a bakery in a place called Beechworth, which is about two and a half hours on a road to nowhere outside of Melbourne, and he turned it into $10 million of turnover on multiple sites. And I'll leave you with this story because Occasionally I have this discussion with employers, I, I, I tell them this story. Because all of a sudden you had people start travelling from all over the world saying, how did you build this? How did you build such a successful business as bakers? And he'd tell them, and one of the key issues was we spend so much time and effort in developing and training our people. And invariably he'd have the question, but what happens if you expend all of that money, time and effort and they leave. 
And his typical response was, what would happen if I didn't and they stayed? So thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, Professor Paul, I'm just wondering about the comment that you make, um, kind of like double your learning, triple your income. At the moment, I'm sitting in a room sometimes in a sessional academic room where there's a lot of people with a lot of learning, but not much income at the moment. Um, that's one part of the question. The other part is kind of you are already successful kind of like in your jobs, in your, in your brokering and things like that. Why did you place such an emphasis on academia as well? And also, how did you manage it? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, especially the bit about how did you manage it. Uh, it came at a cost, of course. Um, so, yeah, I think um, with the triple your rate of learning, I guess you need to think about what the learning, what form that learning comes in. Um, and I'd hate you all to think that it, it only comes through getting back to university and getting another degree, because that's not really what I, what I was necessarily intending to imply. Mind you, it doesn't hurt, in my experience. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but I think you, know, you need to work out what, what form that learning comes from. So when you, when you sort of read the stuff that... I, th I think it was... I'm pretty sure it was Robin Sharma that, that, uh, that, that coined that, that phrase. Um, you know, his description of it was, um, I get out of bed at 5.30 every morning and I hit the books. You know, so we're sitting in newspapers or, you know... And I remember sort of a... There was a, a couple of us that... It was actually on, on the AGL executive team where I kind of... We started to really clarify for me and I, I subsequently saw the, the Sharma quip later on, which was a good capture of what we'd spoken about. But we were trying to work out, um, you know, out certain of our functions were, were really, really high-performing and what did we all have in common? And the one thing we worked out was that all those, all those divisions in that business that worked really well, the executives were just ferocious readers. You know, I don't, when I get on an aeroplane, you know, on, a, on an eight-hour flight up to, you know, up to Hong Kong or somewhere to go and you know, do whatever it is that you're doing at the other end, whether it's you know, sort of dealing with investors or, or the capital markets or you know, um, other related business, I don't, I don't watch movies all the way up there. I usually take a big pile of papers that I'm going to be reading on the way up. But I'll just sneak in a movie and a, a few glasses of wine too. But you know, you try and put the time to good use. You know, I don't. I, I, so, so I suppose when I think about so that you know, triple your rate of learning, you've got to think about the time that, you, that you've got at your disposal and where and what form that comes from. And sometimes it's reading. Uh, a lot of times it's actually sort of you know on the job. You know, and, and actually taking the opportunity to learn, step out from the core, if, you, if so to speak. You know. You're, uh, in most organisations that you work in, opportunity, opportunities will be presented to you if you're passionate about what you're doing, right? The opportunities will start to come to you, opportunities that are sort of stepping out from your core, and you need to take those with both hands because that's a part of that triple your rate of learning. Um, in terms of the, the academia and why did I put such a, a premium on it, um, there are a couple of things. One is I think there's, some, there's sort of some malfunct aspect of my sort of personality, sort of this academic ego, and I just sort of kept working, you know, pandering to it. So there's something, something sort of not necessarily healthy about that, I guess. Uh, but what I did find was um, it was a great bit of scaffolding for me as I was moving in and out of different careers. Um, when I moved out of basically a, um, what was effectively a corporate finance role, into running a, a setting up and running a commodity trading business, it just happened to coincide with when I was doing my master's thesis. And I remember sitting down with the then, um, you know, sort of head of the department and said, oh, I see on this course I've got a couple more mandatory subjects to go. How about, one of them looks really boring, how about we cancel that and I'll just do an oversized thesis on commodity trading? And so I lined that up and my thesis became basically the trading strategy for the business that we were running at the time, which was a you know, $1.5 billion power company and we were you know, turning over three or 400 million bucks a year on, in the commodity floor. Um, so I managed to wrap the, 
you know, the, I mean, with most of the academic stuff I've done over the years, I don't know whether I'm working or studying. Never have. My PhD, I didn't know whether I was turning up to work or turning up to university, quite honestly. I had no idea. Though I just, I, I intertwined them so heavily that they became the one thing. And even now when I'm sort of, you know, so I'm writing a piece at the moment. In fact, I've got to write it for Anne Tiernan's subject, you know, so I've got to do this assignment. I think she wanted a couple of thousand words. I think I'm up to 8,000, right, with a whole bunch of mathematical equations mm -hmm. and all that, which is going to be interesting for a political scientist to mark. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but the point is um, uh, it stopped becoming a university assignment a long time ago. I'm actually trying to work on the next great piece of, you know, mm -hmm. policy and, you know, sort of power stations and, you know, consumer demand and all that sort of good stuff. So I think that's why I put a premium on it. It's, it I think for me it became a bit of scaffolding mm -hmm. and it gave me that sort of deep knowledge. And the nice thing about it is, too, you work out, you know, when you're sitting in a, in a room of, of people, remember, all you need to know is 1% more information than everyone else in the room. That makes you the expert. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the university has a healthy habit of getting you to that 1% mark. Good question. Great answer. Fantastic. Next question. Um, thank you very much for all your speeches and uh, open question to whoever wants to take it or if all three of you would like to respond. Um, one of the things that you can sometimes find when making career changes is that something was wonderfully promised to you and the job looked amazing and then you actually start working in it and it's nothing like what it was meant to be. So I wondered if you had any advice and I hope I'm not the only person that's been through this or something that I think people will experience. What do you do when you sort of end up in a position that looked like the gold standard of what you wanted, turned out it wasn't, and then it's sort of early stages, so you feel uncomfortable making a move or et cetera. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting question. I, I think for someone who's a graduate, it's very hard to get a gauge for what the culture of the business is like, mm. what the role actually is. Um, and so um, it is very difficult because you're also in a position, if you are a graduate, that um, I want a job. And here's an employer that potentially ha gives me that opportunity. So it is more difficult in that, in that uh, circumstance. Clearly, uh, I encourage as much due diligence as you can about the company and the organisation. I mean, we have so much information at our fingertips online these days that... Um, you know, clearly there is an opportunity to find out depending on the type of organisation it is and how much public information is available. Um, greatest challenge, uh, and, and that question goes deep into so many different issues. It could be about a hiring manager who's just not a wonderful person. It could be about the role itself. Um, for someone who is more senior and looking at a, uh, a, a transition somewhere else, um, you're in a position to make an informed decision and it isn't as much, I suppose, for want of a better term, cap in hand, um, you know, I'm looking for a job, I want my first opportunity. So, um, first of all, as a firm, um, the recruitment industry has a terrible name and, to be honest, rightfully so, um, because it is about transactions, it is about structure and it is about the structure that creates a certain behaviour. So many recruitment consultants are about bums on seats and not a lot else. Um, I know it's rhetoric, but we, we like to get to understand our clients. And over the years, over 10 years, we've actually sacked clients. I say that in a nice way. But in the context that um, we know that culturally they're not the right place for us to present quality people. So. Um, if you are engaging with a recruitment firm, um, there's a whole lot of messages I haven't got the time to, to speak with you about today, but um, you control what happens. Don't let them control what happens. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, in a nutshell, uh, do your due diligence. If you're more senior transitioning, um, it probably gives you a great uh, opportunity to drive the conversation as two-way rather than one. Um, and, uh, yeah, work with third parties to support you as best you can. I'm getting, probably going to give some advice that, uh, you know, people won't necessarily agree with. The first thing I would say, and I've come from a recruitment background, I even worked for an agency for a while, um, just because you've got a job doesn't mean you stop looking. 
I mean, you, I, I actually think my advice to you too would be stop thinking about jobs. Think about your own career. Now, I say that as someone who's been self-employed for 20 years. It is not necessarily easy, but when you put control of everything in someone else's hands, and I, I, I love Paul's comments before about he got this great sponsor and people who were, you know, looking out for him. But at the same time, I couldn't help but think to myself, I'm too, I wouldn't want to give my control of my career over to someone else who might, might be, I'm not saying this was your story, Paul, but determining, well, this is the next step I think you should go on. Well, what if I don't want to? What if I, and, and this is where I find when I'm working now with team leaders, the classic situation is you're really good at the technical work that you do, whatever your field is, so let's make you the team leader. If you don't want to do it, it's not going to work. Up is not everybody's career trajectory, just like my you don't always dance going forward example. Sometimes it's sideways, sometimes it's backwards, sometimes it's decisions where people go, what? So I would... Firstly, don't get yourself in that situation where someone else has the control. Not to be a control freak, but to say, and in fact, the first book I ever wrote um, was about five attitudes you need to be successful at work. And, and I was just thinking about it before while I, I was listening to the other speakers, and, and one of them is that you need to manage your own career. And you need to think like, you're, another is to think like you're self-employed, even if you have a job. So that if I was then, in that scenario, firstly, from the moment I arrived, I would be clarifying with whoever I'm reporting to about well, what is my role, what are the time frames for those things you've promised me, and not in an aggressive way, but the minute you discover that, that you'll promise something that you're not getting, you assertively have a discussion with them around, well, this is what we, I, you said when I started, which hopefully you have in writing. The amount of he said, she said conversations you get now, I did this with clients. I had a one and a half hour phone conversation with a client today about a project that's gone off the rails a little bit. We're getting it back on. Nothing I'm doing. It's just some of the participants are very um, resistant to actually doing this. I then followed it up with, not my greatest writing, I have to say, an email outlining exactly what we just discussed. With a note at the bottom that said, if this is not your recollection of what we said, tell me now. Because you cannot rely on people promising you things verbally. Uh, and you need to be the same with your career. If you promise you're going to do something, you need to deliver on that too. Very easy for you to say, oh, you didn't give me this. Well, actually, we asked you to do these things and you haven't delivered. So it may well be that that hesitation of them delivering on what, what they promised is because they don't know how to tell you you're not meeting their expectations. If you start the conversation and with a, how am I going, I'm open to feedback, you may actually discover the real reason for what to you looks like a broken promise. Fantastic. All um, right, well, uh, we are out of time for questions. However, we're going to go to networking. I was going to say, you wanted to get a word. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry, oh, Professor Paul, if you respond. Yeah, let me, yeah. is that all right, Ruth? Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll give, because I'll give you a, a take on mm. it. Um, mm. So, um, uh, I'd probably go back to that, that earlier comment I made about sort of, you know, you've got to be passionate. If you're not passionate, get out of Dodge. I think that's, that's above all. I think on, in terms of sponsors, if I left anyone with the impression that someone's managing career, no, you man, you, your career is yours. In fact, you know, in, inside my organisation, I make sure every employee has a career development plan. Uh, it's, it's mandatory they have it. There's a template that I've got, but they own the document. No one can own that for you. You know, it, it, it's, you've got to manage your own career. And the plan can be wrong, right? But, it, you know, you don't want to fail a plan. But I think if you find yourself when you're, and you're in that dark alley, um, and, I, and I've, I've been there, you know, I got to a, you know, not every, as I said, you know, not everything uh, that I touched turned to gold. I, you know, kissed plenty, plenty of frogs, as they say. Um, and so what did I do in those circumstances? I was being paid a fortune, a lot of money, you know, sort of in the top 1% of the country. Um, so it wasn't about money. But the job itself wasn't fitting. You know, there, it was, there was a misalignment between values and, 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 you know, the essence of the role. So I got out. Um, I took a massive pay cut. Uh, at the time, um, by the way, and, and I, it was really good, I thought, you know, Rick's comment up there, you've got to compromise on income every now and then. By the way, where I went to, money was fine, just by comparison, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a fraction. Um, but I could spot, I'd, I'd got into, I'd back myself into a wrong corner. Um, and it happens, it happens all the time. And, and I think, you know, what you've got to do is, as I say, rip the Band-Aid off. Um, I think the other thing, though, too, is that, the, you know, you also want to convince yourself that, um, you know, it's not, it's not you, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. that, you know, make sure that you, 
you're doing what you should be doing, uh, you know, so for all the obvious reasons. You're not being ostracised and all that. But I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't put... I don't put things in writing much when you get to those tricky situations too. I'd much rather have the conversation. I don't want to leave a paper trail of some of the stuff that I first think, you know, usually you're, you know, not everything that you put in paper and in writing is going to actually work for you. Um, I think it's good to do that, but press save rather than send. Um, and maybe print it out and, and, and reflect on it the next morning and then work the out... 24-hour rule. Do, yeah. do I really need to send this or can I just actually have the adult conversation? Do you know, when you go to a, a, a contract, there's a bloody big problem. You know, if you're, going to, if you're reaching for a contract, there's a problem. Uh, in, and that's whether you're, you know, buying a house, you know, building something, you know, whether it's a power station or your employment. If you're reaching for your employment agreement, something's wrong and you need to really think about, is this really where I want to go or do I just rip off the band-aid, get out of Dodge and go and find something I'm passionate about? I always say, on the way through, protect the bank account. So, you know, don't sort of necessarily chop... I mean, at the end of the day, you also, you know, you've got to feed yourself, you've got to keep a roof over your head, especially if you're responsible for, for others in your, in your life. So sometimes that mean, it means, you know, you need to take a bit of medicine while you're doing it. Um, but while you're taking that medicine, remember, you know, you also... People don't remember how you came, they remember how you left. So it's really important, you know, if you find... You know, when I was in that place and I wanted to get out, I managed to get my way out... But I tell you what, I worked my fingers to the bone to the day I left. And, you know, as I walked out of there, I was able to walk out with head, head held high. And, you know, people in that organisation, I, I know I'm still well respected by all those people I used to work with. They don't know that I was sort of a bit wound up about it. You know, I kept that pretty quiet. But, you know, people remember how you leave, not how you came. Mm. Straight advice. Mm. All right, so thank you very much. Um, congratulations and thank you in the usual alcoholic group of ways. <laughs> <laughs> It struck me in my excitement of reading you all, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Ruth McFayer, I'm a professor at the business school. I'm a passionate adult educator, I'm a slightly interested head of department. So <laughs> I will be hanging in for the next session. We're going to do some networking now for yep. around 10 15 minutes, so it's time to come and ask our panel some questions outside while you're feeding yourselves. And then we're going to come back in here and I'm going to be listening very intently to Karen who's going to tell me in five steps how to reinvent my career. So I look forward to that. Please join us for some supper. Oh, I do love a group with a bit of alcohol in them. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have any in me. Okay, can I get everybody's attention? We've got a few people still coming back from food and getting drinks, so they'll come in in a moment. I've got till 8.30, because I realise you all have lives. And in fact, after telling you that I just had breakfast with that friend I haven't seen for 35 years, we're having drinks after this. Because, you know, when you see, haven't seen someone for a long time, you go, well, you don't want to make a big commitment in case it turns out that it goes all weird. But we got on so well, we went, yeah, I, he said, what are you doing tonight? And I went, well, actually, I'm doing this. He said, let's catch up afterwards. So he's loitering downstairs somewhere. No, it's not a date for those of you who I'm joining the dots together here, okay? He's married. How do you know I even like men? Come on. I do. Um, okay, so this is a workshop component. So it's going to be about you doing the work. Now, I have got like two slides. Seriously, that's all I did. In the end, I went, oh, I just want something behind me so it looks good in the video. Say hello for the video. All right, but what I want to do is get you doing the work. You know, I've spent a lot of time not only figuring out my own career, I regularly help friends um, and clients People employ me to help them develop their leadership skills and in the end to help them find a new job. Their employers don't always appreciate that. We just don't tell them. Uh, but I've learned a lot of things about, you know, changing careers, doing it the right way, doing it the wrong way. One of the other speakers said before, they didn't have a plan. I had no plan at all. I still don't most of the time. Uh, but what I have figured out is what I like and what I'm good at. And I use that as a, as a base. So what I want to do is take you through a few activities that, that will get started tonight, 
But can I encourage you that after tonight that you go away and do a lot more work on them? Because you're not going to sit here and get the one magic answer. If there was one magic answer to the perfect career, just like how to lead a team, you know, we'd have written a book on it, everybody would buy it, it'd be done. The reality is that it's going to be different for everyone. Right? So I do want to make this interactive. If you haven't already said hello to the people at your table, you're going to get an opportunity to, to work with them. I think the tables are relatively even, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, you will need pen and paper. So please find those if you haven't already. You will also notice I put some postcards on your table. Um, they're optional. I haven't even necessarily put one out per person, but I've got more here. I'm going to talk about some resources as I go through. Now, whilst you may not be interested in my thriving team leader indicator that I use for clients, I figured you could use it if you wanted to get some of these other free resources I'm going to talk about, which aren't on my website. They're just they're stuff that I've got that I thought might be useful for this group. Plus... <laughs> I bought a few copies of one of my books, so I might give a few away and if there's any left at the end, if you really want one and you think you're going to use it or know someone who will, take it, but I've only bought a few. Um, I'm not going to try and sell them to you or anything. I'm actually in the process of upgrading the book to a new version, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to get a few out there, whether it's for our students or for some of our more experienced people. So there's a few of those there as well. Uh, now, forgot to find the clicker. Any ideas? She says, having used to, I used to teach people IT. There you go, that'll do. That is my entire presentation. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of background here. I, I've been through a lot of, of career changes, even with, in running my own business. I've had those ups and downs that you heard about before, and I've had moments where I've gone, you know, do I really want to do this anymore? I make a really bad employee. Right? And I used to work in HR. You know, not a good combination. Uh, but in the process in the last couple of years of, of figuring out well, where do I want to take my business, I got fascinated by this idea of reinvention and I thought, do I want to reinvent? Do I want to stop talking about um, developing team leaders and do something else? So earlier this year I did a little project where I started interviewing people. In the end I did 20 and learnt some really fascinating things in these interviews about reinvention. And in fact one of the things I discovered is that most people said they didn't reinvent. They did a pivot. And if you look up pivot in the dictionary, it's actually moving from a central point in a slightly different direction. And in fact, in dancing, we pivot all the time. So I love the little connection there. And so I did some further work on this and, and thought, is this viable for a business? Is this where I want to go? And in the end, I went, you know what, this is, and, and I'm happy to honestly say this to you, it ended up that this little project was more about me sorting out some stuff than it was a new business direction. It was almost like therapy. But what I did come up with was this little model, which is, is applicable in other areas. And I do love things that all start with the same letter, if you haven't figured that out already. It's actually a really good adult education principle. Makes it easy for you to remember and me to remember. Acronyms are the same. I love metaphors. So these R's, what I wanted to do is take you through them. And I've got a few ideas here. I've got, you know, one little bit of paper that I'm going to use to explain what they mean. And this is some stuff that I learned from, as I said, interviewing these 20 people who'd all reinvented their careers in some way to find out, you know, how they did it. So the very first thing I want to talk about is reflecting. And I am big on reflecting. All my clients, I get them to keep a journal. Who here keeps a journal? Show of hands. Right? Now, a journal doesn't have to be, dear diary, I see this cute boy on the bus today. <laughs> or you can write that stuff if you want. It's about you critically analysing things that are going on. And he, here's partly why. Can anyone tell me what you were doing on the 6th of September 2016? In other words, today, la last year. Anyone? Yeah, Facebook will probably... Exactly. In fact, Facebook reminded me this Father's Day that it's been two years exactly since a particular event happened in my life. I went spoke at a conference in Biloela. Anyone been to Billow, as they call it, out past Gladstone? Had a lovely conference for this, this um, country women's association, the Queensland Regional Rural and Remote Women's Network. Got in the shower the next morning to take a shower. Had a bit of a, a head cold, slipped over, dislocated my finger. It'll never be the same again. I'm left-handed. Couldn't use it for three months. So some things stick in your mind, don't they? But the reality is most of us can't remember. So that's why I think reflection is so important. If you're not already keeping a journal of, if nothing else, the wins you are having in your career. 
the number of friends I've helped lately get jobs, and in fact I helped one get a job at Griffith University. I'm not going to give his name away, he hates it when I do that. But I, said, I started going through his, you know, okay, here's the, the job criteria and what have you done? And I'm going, what, have you ever done this? And he'll think, and then two days later he'll call me back and he'll go, oh, I remembered something now. And I went, well, is there a lesson there for you? So now he's working on this project at, at Griffith and I'm saying to him, you are writing this stuff down. What you did in this project, because you, you, you don't know where his career is going to go. Even just a, a promotion within the university, he could use it. So here's what I want you to reflect on, if you can get a piece of paper up the right way. Three things. So write these three things down and then we're going to get you to start thinking about them. Number one is understand yourself. Sounds really simple, doesn't it? Understand yourself. Number two, analyse your experiences. I don't care how old you are in this room, you've still had some. Some of you will just take longer than others to complete that activity. All right, so understand yourself, analyse your experiences, and the third one is create a vision of your future. Not a goal, a vision. So the third one's create a vision of your future. Okay. So I just wanted to give you a quick little explanation of what I mean by those things, and then I want you to just individually, even if you can only answer one of those questions right now, just pick, because we're going to run out of time otherwise, pick the one that grabs you. Everyone at your table might do a different one. What we're going to do is ask you to personally write something down and then have a share at your table. Now, it doesn't have to be everybody and in turn. Some of you might go, I got something, and others will go, nah, not getting it yet. Let that person skip, okay, because you're going to run out of time. So here's the thing. The understanding yourself, that's that core motivation stuff I started to talk about in my 10 minutes before. And I've got a few here. I mean, I love the letter C. I don't care what letter you use. Uh, I figured out what Paul, um, Paul's is. Contribution. He even, I think, used that word. His goal, whether, what a career he had, what he did, he likes to contribute. So I've come up with a list. I've put uh, challenge, collaboration, compassion, connection, contribution, creativity, and of course, my personal favourite, curiosity. I don't care if they're not they're not those words. I don't care if they don't start with C. What I want you to do is go, is there a word that when you think of yourself or when other people describe you that you go, that's what I'm about? And if you don't know what it is, there's your goal for the next week, month. Start writing stuff down. Pick a word and go, am I that word? Because curiosity wasn't my first word. I put other words. And then I got, to, and I went, no, that's my word. Right, so that might be one activity. Analyzing your experiences. What do you like and dislike about life experiences, not just work, that you've had so far, and what lessons have you learnt? And here's one I've learnt, and it's going to come out really negative, but that's just the way, the truth. I like to be in control. That's why my comments before about, you know, I'm not going to give my control of my career to someone else. I don't even give it to my clients. I'm the one that determines what I do. That's important to me. I dislike other people telling me what to do. Therefore, I've learnt some lessons along the way when I let myself get in that situation. Now, I'm not going to change that about my personality. What I can do is work with it. You know, and that's why I found the thing that works for me. And finally, this creative vision of your future. Now, I'm not talking about just your future work. I'm talking about your life. And I know for those of you who are, who are under 30 in the room, you, you know, you're thinking, I don't know what I'm going to be doing when I'm 50 or 60 or whatever else. But I want you to think about, well, what are those things that appeal to you? If you had that, if someone gave you, you know, the old gave you a million dollars, one lotto tomorrow, you'd still have to do something with your life. What would, what would you want to do? Answers that sound like the Kardashians said them are not going to work. Right? It's got to have some substance to it. So, as I said, pick one of those three things. I can see some of you writing already, which is great. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Share them with some people at your table if you're feeling brave and then I'll come around and get a couple of answers or answer some questions if people are stuck or want to, want to contribute something. Off you go. <laughs> Okay.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, time is up. Time is up. Now, we don't have time for everybody in the room to say something. Obviously, I want to keep this moving along. But firstly, who found this activity challenging? Yeah. Who, who's, for example, the first one never thought about it like that before? Yeah. Because, and look, I'm, I'm always conscious that I'm here on behalf of the university and I need to make sure that, I, th I think Griffiths are great. You know, I've been working with them for 10 years, right? I have a degree myself. I chose not to get an MBA uh, or, or, or any other degree. I wrote five books. It's kind of like having a PhD, right? <laughs> but, but having said that, I think we're all too focused on job roles and titles and following the system. I meet too many people who followed the system and to use an old cliche, you know, it's like they climbed the career ladder, they got to the top and realised they'd lent their ladder against the wrong wall. You know, I, I, you think more about careers now as lattice, you know, like a plant will grow on lattice and it'll grow in all different directions. So you've got to think past I'm an accountant or as if, if I can borrow Ruth down, he said I'm an educator, I said you are, I'm an educator too, but I don't say that. My word's curiosity. What's behind why she educates? My friends down the front who, who are um, musicians and singers, why do they do that? It's not about the instrument or the voice, it's something else. And most people don't think about this. They just go, oh, well, that's a recognised field, I'll do that. But if you look at the people who really love what they do, who are achieving great things, you know, do you think... Um, I'm just plucking one out of thin air. Do you think Steven Spielberg fitted neatly into a category? You know, or, or the, the, the Steve Jobs stories, the never finished universities, because they, they got passionate and they went out there and did something. All right, so who's, oh, we might only get one or two of these in, but who's got an, an example or an answer that they're, they're prepared to share? This is the audience participation part. Yes. And what's your name? My name's Sam. Hi. What would you like to share? Um, oh, well, just we're talking about understanding yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me the number one thing is that I like to be challenged. Like it. Yeah. I like it. So what, what are you doing now that's challenging you? Uh, at the moment, not that much. That's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I actually really like high-stress jobs. Like my, my favourite thing is trying to, like, beat a deadline or solving a massive problem. Who'd be crying in the corner if they, they were left to do that, yeah. No, but I get it. You know, you could say that mine is challenge. I, I'm challenged. I love doing things that other people can't do or won't do. Who here loves public speaking apart from me? There you go. I thought she would. A few of you do, but most people don't. I've also tried stand-up comedy. I'm still working on the jokes. Improv, you know, I, I've done all sorts of things. But I don't like that deadline-driven stuff that doesn't work for me. But you can see that she's starting to get the idea. What is it you're actually studying? I work at Griffith. You work at Griffith yeah. doing what? Um, I recruit high school students to come to Griffith. Ah, there'd be a bit of challenge in that, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, but for you, I'd also be thinking, OK, that's going to be a great role for a while, but what's next for you? And the good thing about a big organisation you know, I, don't, I, I know I'm sort of beating up on working for other people, but the good thing about a big organisation is there are lots of opportunities to move sideways, to stay within that same system. You don't have to go elsewhere, but you do have to be creative about it. Now, here's a, here's a re little resource opportunity for you. I've got to get my other piece of paper and board I wrote. My very first book I ever wrote, trust me, I got better after this one if you do get end up with a copy of it. Um, it's called Attitudes That Work. Five attitudes that I believed help people be successful in whatever career. I can't remember the order, but I did remember what they were called. Manage your own career. Master change. Think like you're self-employed. Be a lifelong learner and promote yourself. All right, so they're the five things. And it's kind of like a little activity book. You can have it for free. So if you, if that, if you think one of those five things sounds of interest to you, um, just you can write your name and details on the card and just put the word attitudes, you know, and I will send it to you, right? Because this is not a five-minute exercise to understand yourself and to get some of these concepts going. All right. Anyone else want to uh, ask a question or talk about something they said? Not understanding yourself because we've covered that one. Did anyone do one of the other two? Anyone, anyone? Yes, over here. Hi. Johanna, who I met before. Thank you. I did number three. Uh, create a vision for your future. Yes. Uh, and it was chilling to realise I don't have one. Mm. Who can relate? 
I've, I've always had one. Um, and suddenly I'm at that sort of mid-career point. There's a child, there's a mortgage. Um, and, and I had the linear vision before. Not so much anymore. Uh, and that was uh, a really important insight. And it's interesting, we were chatting before, and you are obviously with that accent uh, from the UK, and you're here for a year. And you're, just remind me what your area was? Corporate governance, Corporate governance right. So, that idea of going to a different country, having a child, having achieved a certain level in a career, like you, you knew what you wanted, you knew what you wanted, I can relate to that with my own business. I had all these goals, things I wanted to do, you know, income targets, making accreditations. I, I've spoken in eight countries. I still remember the first time I ever got to speak overseas. Somebody I knew who used to be a speaker went back into corporate HR for a, a hotel group. My first overseas speaking engagement was in Shanghai, China. I mean, how do you beat that for a first, you know? But the point is, yes, you can achieve a lot and then go, I actually don't know what's next. And that's where you do need to sit and do some thinking. What is that vision? And I've even done that in my business to go, okay, well, I'm 53. You've probably done the maths already. Um, I don't want to work past 60, so I've got a plan for the next six years, six and a half years of what I'm going to do. And, what, and, and my plan after that is I'm going to be a professional house sitter. Anyone heard of trustedhousesitters.com? I'm on it. You go, and you, you go and stay at people's houses and look after their pets. I practised my first public speaking as a volunteer at Taronga Zoo handling live animals. Yeah. So I've looped it around and I figured out what I love doing. I love travel, I love, I'm curious, I love animals. I can still work part of the year, but part of the year I'm going to live overseas. Once I figured out that's where I want to be, in 2024, the rest is pretty easy. It's amazing what happens. But tell you what, it took a long time to figure that out. And some of you at this point are looking at me like I am insane. <laughs> but it, that mightn't be what you want to do, but it excites me. And it might change in two years from now. But for right now, it is motivating me to do things. You've got to figure out what yours is. Yes, Sam. I have a question. I would want to gauge your um, opinion on especially for women or younger generations, uh, we're talking about not being linear. And my biggest concern is kind of saying, I'm going and going traveling or stopping for a year to have a child or like you said, not having that constant employment and working your way up. What, what's your thoughts on people who kind of just run away for a couple of years and go to Jamaica? Jamaica, hmm. <laughs> oh, Johanna wants to comment on that. Someone who's run away from England and had a baby. Um, yeah, yeah, tell me about it. Um, what I was going to say is, that, so in, in the UK, we've we've had a big discussion about recruitment to university and how do you view gap years, and that's effectively what you want. You want a gap year in your career, right? And I went along to uh, a talk a bit like this, and 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 the, and the lady who um, was running a consultancy, not unlike yours. And the point she made, which I thought was useful, is regardless of what time of life and you, you want to make a gap year, um, make it worthwhile. Do something in the gap year that adds to your CV. Mm -hmm. So if that is going to another country and you learn the language, no one's going to penalise you for that because you've got an additional skill. And funny enough, the example she used was don't go to Queensland University, don't go to Queensland and, and spend a year surfing and do nothing else, <laughs> right? Get a surfing qualification. Right? Get a coaching qualification. Do what you love, but do something with it at the end of it that adds to your CV. Sorry, I don't know. No, that's... That is, that is fantastic advice. Now, I will, um, d just to sort of answer your question a bit further, I'm single and have no children, right? So I, I cannot speak to um, taking a career break for, for children. But I can say that you can't put all... It's a cliche. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. So even if you've got a job... You need to be going, uh, what's the term we use today? Side hustle. You need to, what else can you do? I, I, over the years, I've had various jobs and on the side, I write people's resumes. Help them go for, like me going for recruitment or whatever is just so simple. It's like walking down the street. And, I, and, you know, and yet friends go, oh, I never thought about it like that. Like when you say to someone, what is the purpose of a resume? It's a shame Paul is, um, Rick still isn't here. Most people go, oh, it's to get a job. No, it's not. What's the purpose of a resume? To get an interview. If you think about it like that, it changes your perspective. 
So when you know a lot about something, use even if you go, I'm sick of doing that, use it as your side hustle, your way to keep a foot in there, and maybe, yes, take that break or d try that something different without losing connection. But I think what Johanna had to say was really important is, yeah, s show that you got something out of it, not just I took a year off. Be a volunteer. Do a project. Do a something that you can say, I chose to take this year to do X. It happened to be in Jamaica or wherever. And I think the same is true. And, and again, I'm not speaking from any experience here. Yes, have a year off to, when you have a child. But don't just to make it about having the child. What could be something that you could learn in that time? Maybe not in the first few months. But, but you know, certainly over that time, you would have some opportunity to go, how can I start a group for other mothers where we help support each other? That could be something that looks good on your resume. Trust me, if you've got more than one child, yes. negotiation skills, they'll be astounding. Exactly. <laughs> you just got to repurpose what you're learning. Yeah. All right, so I'm conscious of our time here. So I, I, I'd have to say I've spent the most time on the first one because it's the most important. If you get it right, the rest are actually pretty easy in comparison. So number two I put here is research. Or well, researching, I think I've done. What you need to do is from this planning, this, this reflecting that you've done, is go, okay, what are some options that I could go with? One could be start my own business in some way. You know, put that, at least explore it. Another could be, you know, this, this path, this path. Like, what are some ways I could use those skills? At least write down those options, even if they sound crazy. You don't want one plan. You want a few different things, because what, you'll see what I'm going to recommend next. In doing that, get some input. Now, who could you get input from in putting together these options? Give me some ideas. Who could you get input from in putting together your options based on your reflection? Information interviews. Fantastic, Gail. So you call someone, and look, people do this with me all the time um, who want to become speakers. I've been a member of Professional Speakers Australia since 2001. I've been on their board. I meet people who go, oh, I want to be a speaker. Anyone in this room want to be a speaker? You know, happy to give you some of my time and tell you where to get started. So if you want to put on the back of yours, I'll, and I'll give you a call. I don't drink coffee, so that's not going to work, but the phone will work too. I can give you those first couple of steps to go, okay, you seriously want to be a speaker? Here are, the th here are the things you need to do. You go away and do those. You come back and tell me what happened. Then I might tell you the next bit. Because if you're not serious, I'm not wasting hours of my time if you're not going to do anything with it. But get input from people you know. Now, you've got to be careful here of people who have a vested interest in getting you to do things. Who might those people be? Your current employer... Who else? Your parents, family members, friends, people who maybe are locked into one way of looking at the world. Now, I'm not saying you don't ask some of them for advice, particularly if they do have some useful advice. But what I want you to do is go out and look widely. It could be, I mean, it could be reading something Richard Branson wrote if you're thinking of getting entrepreneurial. You don't have to have met the man, but get lots of input, different perspectives. Figure out the ones you disagree with. Figure out the ones that resonate with you. Figure out who's doing what you're doing. Who here is on LinkedIn? Good. That's pretty well every hand in the room. Now, I'm not saying it's the only site, but it is very helpful in um, connecting with the right people. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was um, started my degree. I was working full-time in an employer association, sort of as the training coordinator but I wasn't a trainer yet. And I started this degree in adult education, two nights a week and every second weekend. And the best piece of advice I got in that program, I wasn't the only one who didn't have the exact job I wanted. Best advice I got from one of my lecturers was, hang out with the people who are doing what you're doing. Learn from them. And you never know, and it ha in my case, I got promoted to, to trainer at my current company, but other people actually found jobs that way. So you've got to hang out with the people who are doing what you want. That might be via volunteering in some way, going to uh, networking groups, joining an association. Yes, there's a little bit of money maybe involved in doing these things. But if you can at least then eliminate things you don't want to do. Right? So I'm, I'm a big believer in the do list and the don't list. 
Figure out what you don't want to do. Yeah. I figured out I shouldn't work with accountants or lawyers. You know, I'm sure they're very nice people, but they don't resonate with me and my style and I don't resonate with them. Right? So you've got to figure out what you're not about as much as what you are about. So do your research, sign some options, get lots of input. And then from that, create a plan of some sort and go, okay, and that plan might be three months, six months, 12 months. At which point you go, okay, I'm going to try this far and then I'm going to do a check-in. As you'll see up here, we talk about, ref, you know, reviewing or whatever else. But at least get a, a bit of a plan. Then you've, this is a very important part, the readying. You've got to ready yourself to change. And by this, again, I, I do love my threes, although I think one of them's a two because I just ran out of ideas. Um, readying, develop the right mindset. Anticipate barriers, organise support. Okay, so right mindset, anticipate your barriers, organise support. So just, I've been doing a bit of talking now. For this one, I want you at your table to... Look at those three things and as a team, come up with some things you think I'm going to suggest you do around those. So, what do I mean by the right mindset? What barriers might you likely face in doing this? And uh, who can support you in it? Go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, your time is up. Time is up. So if we can hear from a few different people this time, I love a group that's energetic. We can hear from a few different people this time. What of any of those things, let's look at the first one. Well, what sort of mindset do you think I'm, I'm talking about you needing to have to ready yourself for this process? Confidence. Absolutely. You've got to have confidence. You know what you've got to have confidence in? Confidence in the fact that you are going to fail. Right? You are going to do things wrong. But you're actually doing a process of elimination. You want to walk far enough down a path that you go, nah, that's not it. And then you cannot think about that anymore. Who, who has that problem in their brain where they've got five things they could do and they don't know which one? There you go. Well, you know what you need to do is you need to go far enough down the path on any one of those that you go, nah. But you've got to know what your criteria are on the way. And that comes back to the stuff I said before about, you know, what's important to you. You know, well, they can't be all important. You know, there's a great book that I've read recently, and I know this is being videoed, so you might have to just be careful with this next word. I, I might change the word. There's a, great, there's a guy called Mark Manson, M-A-N-S-O-N. He has a blog, which is very popular. Go and look it up. He's also written a book. All right, I'm going to say this the nicest way I can. The Subtle Art of Not Giving a... Starts with F, right? And he uses that word a lot in this book, right? Uh, you know, don't be offended by that. That's his style. It's obviously stand out. But you know what he really is talking about? Figure out what your one thing is. You can't care about everything. You've got to figure out what are you going to put your effort into? What are you going to give, to paraphrase, and what are you going to give a damn about? And by doing that, you have to automatically then exclude all the other things you don't care about. And not be sucked in to, I'm getting, I'll get on my little philosophical soapbox now, sucked in to all the stuff that the world tells you you should care about. You know, I do not care about state of origin football. In fact, I do not care about any sport on this planet apart from dance sport, which is competitive ballroom dancing. No? I, look, I must admit, when the Olympics are on, I'll watch the ice skating and the gymnastics because I've done both in the past. But the point is that you don't have to care about that stuff. But how many of us get into conversations where we pretend we support a team? Stop putting your effort there. Just go, it's not my thing. I can appreciate people who love that, who are passionate about it, because I am passionate about dancing. I, that I can understand. So if Les here is, you know, go the Broncos or whoever it is, I, no, he's not. He's just... 
You're with me? Okay. But, but whatever his thing is, I'm not going to diss it. I'm going to go, I get the passion you have for that. I once had, was on an, I was once on an island for five days in Malaysia to speak for one hour at a conference, don't you love some clients, with Glenn McGrath, the cricketer. I think of cricket as like watching grass grow and paint dry, right? But I get Glenn's passion for the sport and that's what we connected on. Not the fact that he plays a sport that, you know, I don't get. He didn't get mine either. He's too tall for me to dance with anyway. But the point, you, so you, but you've got to figure out what are those things. And yet you, you can be, and this is segueing a little bit, there is such a thing, it's called a polymath. Look it up, Google it, polymath, which means you are someone who is good at lots of different things. Right, so that could truly be you, but there are actually, it's a very small percentage of the population. If it really comes down to it, you know, if I said to you, a whole bunch of things you're not allowed to do, you've got to pick one, two, three things, you would quickly figure out what they were. So, we have reflected, we've researched, we've readied. Realising is enacting the plan, is testing it out, is trying stuff and seeing what works. This is where you do things like volunteer, take on a part-time job, write that book you said you were going to write. My friend Sam who wants to be a speaker. You start calling, you figure out what you're going to talk on, you write one, at least one keynote and you start knocking on doors and going, I'm here, I'm not going to charge you anything, give me a go. I can name dozens of places that would have you tomorrow if you, you know, as long as you actually can speak. You know, um, and try it and see what happens and see if you actually like doing it or not. Because you won't know until you actually give it a try. And that's where I discovered I went and did a stand-up comedy course. Some friends who were speakers were doing it. I love the idea of learning a bit about comedy. But do you know how much they pay comedians for a gig? Seriously, it's ridiculously low money. I earn, we, earn, we figured out very quickly that we earn ten times as much as they do for a one hour's worth of work. So I don't want to be a comedian. But I got what I wanted out of it and moved on. Maybe you'll discover the same thing. And that comes back to that first point I made about why. What is that thing about you that you're trying to fulfil that th you're hoping this kind of work will give you? Now, it doesn't take much to guess what the last one is, the reviewing. Once you've gone out there and, and tried this plan, and it might be for three months or six months or however long you need to give it, don't give up on the first no. You've got to keep going. You've got to, you know, if the first opportunity doesn't work, find another one. If you give up too quickly, it says you didn't really want to do it. And that's what Mark Manson talked about in his book. He said he wanted to be a rock star. He saw himself on stage, the, air, the guitar, the fans screaming at him. But you know what he didn't like doing? Practicing. I'm sure the musicians can understand that. He figured out he, he actually didn't want to be a musician. He just wanted the accolades that came with it and the girls and the whatever else. So he, he quickly figured out that that actually wasn't his thing. He, he was going after it for all the wrong reasons. So you've actually, there, you know, you've got to do that review of, well, what have I learned in this process? What have I eliminated for my friend over here who's good at everything, wants to do everything at once? You know, what can I, that's all right. We, we can all, lots of people can relate to that. What have I eliminated? And I've deliberately then had review goes back to reflect. What have I now learned about myself? And on we go. And the reality is you're going to keep doing that throughout your life. So I know I've given you a lot of information in a short amount of time, but what I'm hoping you can do is, if there is one thing on that piece of paper that you've just written down, of my little steps, that you go away from here tonight as you're driving home, tomorrow when you're going to work, on the weekend when you're doing something random and all of a sudden it pops into your head, or it might be something that one of the other panellists have said to you, if that thing resonates with you, do that. Work on that thing. You don't have to do it in the exact order. Yes, I like a, a model and people love models. But I, I, I don't take big notes at events now. I might write down one or two things. Sometimes I write down nothing. But if it's still running around in my brain three days later, that's telling me something. That's the thing I've got to do something with. So, thank you for coming along tonight, for taking the time out to think about where you want your career to go, whether you're just starting out, whether you're partway through, whether you're coming towards the end of it. The reality is if more people did what you've done tonight, is to actually figure out what they want 
and not just go along that, that easy path that other people have set for them, I think we'd have a lot more happier people in the world. Uh, and, and that would, you know, I'm curious to see what that kind of world would look like. So on that note, I'm going to finish every, every session I have as, as I normally like to do. Firstly, on the way out, if you want to give me back that postcard, if you're interested in the attitudes or you want to learn to be a speaker or... Um, and I've got a few copies of the book here. If you genuinely are interested in learning how to be a team leader or know someone who is, please take one. And other than that, please leave. <laughs> I, think, um, I think Ruth might actually want to say something before I... You know how Jerry Seinfeld... Was, what is, no, what Jerry Seinfeld... Um, Rover Manor says, say hi to your mum for me. Yeah, mine is please leave. <laughs> Once again, please... Thank Karen. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, um, for coming tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. I found it incredibly useful. I'm about to fill out my postcard. Z. Um, please don't forget to do it, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>